Chapter 18, The Secret Document, Searching for 23 High Priests and the Holy Order of Melchizedek. As a member of the LDS Church who had been studying its doctrines and history for nearly three decades, the true details and significance of the special conference of the Morley Farm eluded me until I happened upon a secret document a few years ago. During one of my pilgrimages to Kirtland, I was talking with a tour guide about the amazing Pentecostal events that had taken place in Kirtland during the early years of the Restoration Movement. He confided in me that there was a secret document circulating around, copies of the document which listed the 23 people who were called and ordained to the high priesthood on that fateful day were in the possession of some of the tour guides. He informed me that the list graded each of the 23 high priests with either an F for faithful, an A, or an A for apostate. The apostates were then categorized into one of the three subcategories, depending, according to the creator of the document, on how much light they had previously received and how far they fell, judging by how much they eventually persecuted Joseph Smith and the church, and ultimately, whether they supported Brigham Young during and after the succession crises. The secrecy of the document intrigued me, and I pleaded with him to obtain a copy of it for me, which he did. Even after reading the document, I didn't really see the significance of the event, so I simply cataloged the document for future reference. Several months later, as I was studying some priesthood issues and Joseph Smith's sermon on the three grand orders of priesthood, it occurred to me just how significant that event was. I decided to review the document and do further research into the events of that conference. Unfortunately, I could not find where I had put the document, so I tried to find out who these 23 men were by googling the topic. To my surprise, I was not able to easily find these 23 high priests on the internet by simply doing keyword searches. I then called the LDS Visitor Center in Kirtland, Ohio and interrogated the new LDS tour guides who had replaced the previous ones. They were not aware of the document I had previously obtained from their predecessors and did not have any record of who the 23 high priests were. They did, however, give me the phone number of the visitor center at the Morley Farm. So I called and asked that guide. He did not know either. He commented how strange it is that such information is not easily found. He also remarked that the event took place there at the Morley Farm is not as highly profiled as the visitations of John the Baptist and Peter, James, and John, the vision Joseph and Sidney had in section 76, or the visitation of Christ and Moses, Elijah, and Elias in the Kirtland Temple. He asked me to send him the names of the 23 high priests if I ever found out who they were. Still not wanting to go through the many religious documents I've collected over the years in search of the missing document, I decided to go to the greatest source of information I had pertaining to early history of the church in Kirtland, Ohio. I dug out my book entitled Joseph Smith's Kirtland, a book I highly recommend. This book's one of my prized possessions because it details so many of the incredible Pentecostal events that took place in Kirtland. It was written by Carl Anderson, a member of the church who, as I recall, was a stake president in the Kirtland area and spent much of his life researching the events that took place in Kirtland, Ohio. He's affectionately referred to as Mr. Kirtland, Kirtland by some of the members of the church. To my surprise and utter amazement, the book did not list the 23 high priests. In fact, it didn't even detail the events that took place at the Morley Farm on the occasion in which the ordinations of the first high priests in this dispensation uh, were called. Very strange indeed. Luckily, I eventually found the missing document I'd obtained in Kirtland, which I'm including in this work. Since finding it, I've been informed that the names of all the priesthood leaders attending the conference and the names of the 23 men given at the high priesthood are contained in the Far West Record. I was able to get a copy of that and verify the names in the document that I had been given were accurate. The Original 23 High Priests In that manifestation of deity generally are event-driven, it should be noted that the event in this case was the ordination of men to the office of high priests that resulted in the manifestation of God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ to those being ordained. The location was a small schoolhouse on the hill of the Morley Farm. Joseph Smith ordained Lyman White first, and then Hiram Smith, John Murdoch, Reynolds Cahoon, and Harvey Whitlock, in an order that I do not know. Joseph then began a process of choosing those to be ordained, and Lyman would ordain them. In the end, Joseph had ordained five men and Lyman eighteen. 
The notation following the man's name is my own personal notation of how the men and their activities might be grouped. A equals is just an ordinary apostate who generally just went his way. A exclamation point is an apostate who then turns on the church to bring real trouble. A asterisk is an apostate who fell away, but it will take God to determine their fate. These men are as follows. A. Wheeler Baldwin, Ezra Thire, Harvey Whitlock, and Lyman White. A exclamation point, Ezra Booth, Joseph Wakefield, John Carell, and Jacob Scott. A asterisk, Martin Harris, Thomas B. Marsh, Sidney Rigdon, and John Whitmer. It seems to me that personal pride and a refusal to accept leaders were the two major problems. It's of note that Jacob Scott only lasted one day after this experience. Uh, so this is the this is the paper that he got in that I've been reading you. I, I should have made it more clear because I wasn't quite sure. But right when it started, the original 23 high priests, it's explained that this is the paper that he got in uh, Kirtland. Uh, Wheeler Baldwin, A, uh, born March, 7th of March, 1793, died of May, anyway, was converted by a special experience when Satan in the form of a brain mule was caused to pass away from him and his traveling companions through the power of prayer, performed mighty miracles, ordained a high priest 6th of June of 1831. So he was an apostate. Ezra Booth, A exclamation point, um, baptized in Kirtland of 1831, uh, Elsa Johnson's healing missionary, apostatized in September of 1831, and was excommunicated in 6th of September 1831. Ezra helped tar and feather Joseph Smith at the Johnson Farm in 1832. Then we've got Reynolds Cahoon. He's F for faithful. Um, he's one of the first to join Kirtland. Um, he was a counselor in the state presidency. He worked on the Kirtland Temple. Um, then you've got Simeon Carter. Uh, he had a F her faithful John Carell, A exclamation point, Solomon Hancock, F. I'm not going to read each one of these and all that they did. I'm just going to let you refer to the book or, or stop the writing. You can look through all of these 23 to see who did what. So I already briefly had it. Okay. Fortunately, we have a pretty good record of what transpired from the diaries and journal entries of Levi Hancock, Ezra Booth, Zebedee Coulter, and Philo Dibble, John Whitmer, John Murdoch, John Carell, Lyman White, and Party P. Pratt. John Whitmer was the conference clerk. Admittedly, Ezra Booth and John Carell had apostatized by the time they wrote their remarks and became skeptics and enemies of Joseph Smith and the church. Ezra Booth's remarks are tainted a little bit from his bias, which, in my opinion, makes his recollection just as important as the others in getting a balanced corroboration of testimony of what took place on that occasion. One of the most significant secretive events. As I studied the Melchizedek Priesthood and the amazing event that took place at the special conference at the Isaac Morley farm, I was flabbergasted at how the restoration of the Melchizedek Priesthood completely changed the trajectory of the restored church. It became obvious that an understanding of what took place at that conference becomes a prerequisite, and understanding virtually all the revelations and historical events that followed. I found myself having to reread and reevaluate all of the revelations in the DNC from section 52 on, because the restoration of the Melchizedek Priesthood is foundational to everything that followed. For instance, shortly after the event, the Lord begins to mention the, quote, Church of God, end of quote. This new term distinctly refers to those who received the ordination of the Melchizedek Priesthood. Future revelations would designate those of the Church of God as being administrators over those who are otherwise the providing el presiding elders of the Church of Christ. Although linguistically subtle, the distinction was huge. I have come to believe that the true understanding of what took place at that event and what the Melchizedek Priesthood is challenges the current teachings of the modern church with regard to priesthood doctrine and church history. Additionally, an understanding of this event and of the third grand order of priesthood provides important keys to understanding the prophetic future of this world and explains how and why the first laborers of the last kingdom must return from the dead. 
here's a brief outline of what happened during the first part of that amazing conference. According to John Whitmer, a conference was called by Joseph Smith, which promised a blessing if the elders were faithful. Quote, June 3rd, 1831, a general conference was called and a blessing promised if the elders were faithful and humble before him. Therefore, the elders assembled from the east and the west and from the north and the south and also many members, end of quote. Others remembered the blessing that was to be poured out as being referred to as an endowment. This is the early and more accurate use of the term endowment in LDS theology. Quote, about this time Solomon came to see me and brought Zebedee Coltrane along. Uh, he held some meetings and wanted I should go to Kirtland with him. We started the latter part of May, got there by the last of the month. I learned that on the 4th of June there was to be an endowment of some elders. And that was Levi Hancock, end of quote. Others described the promised events as the beginning of the great and mighty work and that it would involve the work of miracles. Quote, as the 4th of June last was appointed for the sessions of the conference, it was ascertained that that was the time specified when the great and mighty work was to be commenced. And such was the confidence of some that knowing that knowledge superseded their faith, and they did not hesitate to declare themselves perfectly assured that the work of miracles would commence at the ensuing conference. With such strong assurances and with most elevated expectations, the conference assembled at the time appointed. To give, if possible, energy to expectation, Smith, the day before the conference, professing to be filled with the spirit of prophecy, declared that, quote, not three days should pass away before some should see their Savior face to face, end of quote. And that was Ezra Booth. In his introduction, the prophet likened the kingdom of God to a grain of mustard seed that must come, that some would live to see it put forth its branches. He prophesied that some of those present would become martyrs. It's not known if he was aware of his own future martyrdom at the time. Quote, the 4th of June came and we all met in a little string of buildings under the hill near Isaac Morley's in Kirtland, Cuyahoga County, Ohio. We all went to a schoolhouse on the hill and one-fourth of a mile ascending nearly all the way. It was builded of logs and was filled with the slab benches where the elders were seated. The meeting was opened as usual. Joseph began to speak. He said that the kingdom that Christ spoke of, that was like a grain of mustard seed, was now before him, and some should see it put forth its branches. And the angels of heaven would some day come like birds to its branches, just as the Savior had said. And some of you shall live to see it come with great glory, some of you must die for the testimony of this work. End of quote. And that's Levi Hancock. Uh, Philo Dibble testified that in Joseph's opening remarks, he prophesied that there were some in their midst who would see the heavens opened and bear record of the coming of the Son of Man before the conference came to a close. The prophet also prophesied that the man of sin would be revealed during the conference as well. Quote, I saw Joseph Smith, the prophet, when he first came to Kirtland, and was with him in the first conference held in that place, which was in a small schoolhouse. When he arose in our midst, he said that before the conference closed, there were those present who should see the heavens open, and bear record of the coming of the Son of Man, and that the man of sin should be revealed. End of quote. Apparently, Joseph had prophesied of these events the previous day as well. John Whitmer notes that, quote, Joseph Smith, Jr. prophesied, the day previous that the man of sin should be revealed, end of quote. According to Ezra Booth, the prophet cautioned those in attendance in his preliminary remarks to, quote, not be overcome with surprise, end of quote. According to Jared Carter, Joseph Smith, who was not a gifted speaker, became a talented speaker as he became filled with the Spirit. Before this, bracket, i.e. June 6, 1831, end of bracket, was that memorable day when God first gave the fullness of the high priesthood to the elders of the Church of Christ. At the interview, Brother Joseph, notwithstanding he is not naturally talented for a speaker, yet he was filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, so that he spoke as I never heard man speak for God, by the power of the Holy Ghost, spoke in him. And marvelous was the display of the power of the Spirit among the elders present. End of quote. John Whitmer noted that, quote, the Lord made manifest to Joseph that it was necessary that such of the elders as were considered worthy should be ordained to the high priesthood, end of quote. Lyman White becomes the first high priest of this dispensation. Next, Lyman White takes the spotlight as the first man in this dispensation to be ordained to the high priesthood. After the order of the Son of God, 
also referred to as the highest division of the Melchizedek priesthood. This, of course, seems contradictory to those who thought the higher priesthood that Joseph and Oliver had previously received by Peter, James, and John, which included the calling of apostles, was the highest division of the Melchizedek priesthood. The highest priesthood, which is called the Melchizedek priesthood, was bestowed anciently and again restored at the Morley Farm in 1831. However, according to the scriptures, the highest priesthood is not given based on a man's lineage, nor is it given according to the will of man. Rather, it is given according to the will of God and according to the voice of God out of the heavens, as we shall see from the following accounts of this amazing event that occurred at the Morley Farm. And it was delivered, this is a quote, and it was delivered unto men by the calling of his own voice, according to his own will, end of quote. Opening events during the conference at Morley's Farm. First, let us review the collection of Ezra Booth, who states that Lyman White was the first to be ordained to the high priesthood and given the honor of ordaining 16 of the 23 men who would be given the high priesthood, including Joseph and Sidney. It was Joseph's privilege and responsibility to have it revealed to him from God who should be ordained to the high priesthood. Quote, he then laid his hands on the head of Elder White, who had participated largely in the warm feeling of his leader, and ordained him to be the high in, to the high priesthood. He was set apart for the service of the Indians, and was ordained to the gift of tongues, healing the sick, casting out devils, and discerning spirits, and in like manner he ordained several others, and then called upon White to take the floor, White arose, and presented a pale countenance, a fierce look, with his arms extended and his hands cramped back, the whole system agitated, and a very unpleasant object to look upon. He exhibited himself as an instance of the great power of God and called upon those around him, quote, if you want to see a sign, look at me, end of quote. He then stepped upon a bench and declared with a loud voice he saw the Savior. It, however, procured White the authority to ordain the rest. So said the Spirit, and so said Smith. The Spirit and Smith selected those to be ordained, and the Spirit of White ordained them. Um, the following is the recollection of John Whitmer regarding the ordination of Lyman White. Quote, After he had prophesied, he laid his hands upon Lyman White, uh, brackets, and ordained him in a bracket, to the high priesthood after the holy order of God. And the Spirit fell upon Lyman, and he prophesied concerning the coming of Christ. He said that there were some in this congregation that should live until a Savior should descend from heaven with a shout with all the holy angels with him. He said the coming of the Savior should be like the sun rising in the east and will cover the whole earth. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Yea, he will appear in his brightness and consume all before him. And the hills will be laid low and valleys be exalted and the crooked be made straight and the rough smooth. And some of my brethren shall suffer martyrdom for the sake of the religion of Jesus Christ and seal the testimony of Jesus with their blood he saw the heavens open, and the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the Father, making intercession for his brethren. The saints, he said, that God would work a work in these last days, that tongue cannot express, and the mind is not capable to conceive. The glory of the Lord shone around at this conference. These were ordained to the high priesthood, namely Lyman White, Sidney Rigdon, John Murdoch, Reynolds Cahoon, Harvey Whitlock, and Hiram Smith were ordained by Joseph Smith, Jr., except Sidney Rigdon. The following were ordained by Lyman White by commandment, Parley P. Pratt, Thomas B. Marsh, Isaac Morley, Edward Partridge, uh, Joseph Wakefield, Ezra Thayer, Martin Harris, Ezra Booth, who denied the faith, Harvey Whitlock denied the faith, also Joseph Wakefield, Joseph Smith, Sr., Joseph Smith, Jr., John Whitmer. End of quote. Uh, Levi Hancock recalled that Joseph, quote, looked at Lyman White and said, You shall see the Lord, and met him near the corner of the house and laid his hands upon him and blessed him with the visions of heaven. He then stepped out on the floor and said, I now see God and Jesus Christ at his right hand. Let them kill me. I should not feel death as I am now, end of quote. Zebedee Coltrane stated, quote, Then Lyman White was ordained a high priest, Joseph told him he should see the heavens opened, and after he was ordained, he stood on his feet and testified that he could see the heavens open and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. End of quote. Following this conference, the majority of the 23 high priests would be called upon to travel to Jackson County, 
preaching the gospel along the way. As Elder White traveled on this mission, he would inform people that, quote, he was a preacher of the gospel after the order of Melchizedek, end of quote. It should be noted that we have documentation of at least one other person besides Joseph Smith and Lyman White who also testified as having the heavens opened and of seeing the Father and the Son on that occasion. It was Harvey Whitlock. In fact, Joseph Smith had specifically promised both Lyman and Harvey that they would see the heavens open. According to the testimony of Zebedee Coltrane, Harvey was first paralyzed after his ordination, but Joseph rebuked the power that seized him, and it left him. Quote, and he testified as Lyman had done, and he saw the heavens open and Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. This was the beginning of our day uh, of ordinations to the office of the high priest. End of quote. This testimony of Joseph, Lyman, and Harvey is very significant because the scriptures say that by the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. At the Morley Farm, um, restoration of the highest priesthood, we have the testimony of three people who actually received the Melchizedek endowment of having the heavens open and the Father and the Son were revealed. As verified by the testimony provided, the Spirit in Joseph would reveal who God wanted to ordain, and then the Spirit within Lyman would ordain that person. According to one account, Lyman ordained 16 people, including Joseph and Sidney. Joseph ordained Lyman and the remaining elders of the 23 who were ordained. As was pointed out in the later revelation, some of the 23 were simply called, while others were both called and chosen. The man of sin is revealed. Shortly after Lyman White was filled with the Spirit and had the heavens open to him, bearing witness of the Father and the Son, the spirit of Satan entered the room and possessed several of the brethren. Interestingly, according to some of the testimony given, various people at the conference struggled with possession and evil spirits for the next two days, as an evil spirit would be cast out of one man, and then another would become possessed. Quote, Joseph put his hands on Harvey Whitlock and ordained him to the high priesthood. He turned as black as Lyman was white. His fingers was set like claws. He went round the room and showed his hands and tried to speak. His eyes was in the shape of oval O's. Hiram Smith said, Joseph, that is not of God. Joseph said, do not speak against this. I will not... I will not believe, said Hiram, unless you inquire of God. Owns it, Joseph bowed his head a short time, got up, and commanded Satan to leave Harvey, laying his hands upon his head at the same time. At that very instant, an old man said to weigh 214 pounds, sitting in the window, turned a complete somersault in the house, and came his back across a bench and lay helpless. Joseph told Lyman to cast Satan out. He did. The man's name was Lehman Copley, formerly a shaker. The evil spirit left him, and as quick as lightning, Harvey Green fell bound and screamed like a panther. Satan was cast out of him, but immediately entered, so I heard it continued all day and the greater part of the night. Levi Hancock. Here is the recollection of Ezra Booth. Quote, Another elder, who had been ordained to the same office as White, at the bidding of Smith, stepped upon the floor. Then ensued a scene of which you can form no adequate conception, and which I would forbear relating, did not the truth require it. The elder moved upon the floor, his legs inclining to a bend, one shoulder elevated above the other, upon which the head seemed disposed to recline, his arms partly extended, his hands partly clenched, his mouth partly opened and contracted in the shape of an italic O. His eyes assumed a wild, ferocious cast, and his whole appearance presented a frightful object to the view of the beholder. Quote, speak, Brother Harvey, end of quote, said Smith, but Harvey intimated by signs that his power of articulation was in a state of suspense and that he was unable to speak. Some conjectured that Harvey was possessed of the devil, but Smith said, quote, the Lord binds in order to set at liberty. After different opinions had been given and there had been much confusion, Smith learned by the Spirit that Harvey was under diabolical influence and that Satan had bound him, and he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of him. It now became clearly manifest that, quote, the man of sin was revealed, end of quote, for the express purpose that the elders would become acquainted with the devices of Satan, and after that they would possess knowledge sufficient to manage him. This Smith declared to be a miracle and his success in this case encouraged him to work other and different miracles.
and that's by Ezra Booth. John Whitmer's recollection is consistent with the others. While the Lord poured out his spirit upon his servants, the devil took occasion to make known his power. He bound Harvey Whitlock and John Murdoch so that he could not speak and others were affected. But the Lord showed us, Joseph the seer, the design of this thing. He commanded the devil in the name of Christ and he departed to our joy and comfort. Zebedee Coltrane recalled, Harvey Whitlock was ordained next with the same promise, but after his ordination, when standing on his feet, he seemed paralyzed. His mouth was drawn into the shape of an italic O, and his arm was stretched out as if nailed to a cross. Joseph rebuked the power that had seized him, and it left him. Philo Dibble recalled, Then Harvey Whitlock stepped into the middle of the room with his arms crossed, bound by the power of Satan, and his mouth twisted unshapely. Hiram Smith arose and declared that there was an evil spirit in the room. Joseph said, Don't be too hasty, and Hiram sat down. Hiram rose the second time, saying, I know my duty and will do it, and stepping to Harvey, commanded the evil spirits to leave him. But the spirits did not obey. Joseph then approached Harvey and asked him if he believed in God. Then we saw a change in Harvey. After the evil spirit was cast out of Harvey, he had the heavens opened and he saw the son standing on the right hand of the father, just as Lyman had done. The above accounts of this event seems to highlight both the powers of light and darkness that were manifest during the first bestowal of this highest priesthood. Great miracles and the opening of the heavens and the testimony of Jesus Christ took place. Conversely, as promised, the man of sin was revealed. The power of Satan possessing the bodies of some of the brethren was revealed in great power, and those who had been given the priesthood and were faithful now had power to discern and overcome evil spirits. The Dynamics of the Ego A great promise given to those called to the Melchizedek priesthood who are faithful is that they will see the face of God. Just five months after the initial 23 men had been called to be high priests, the Lord revealed that many of them had failed to obtain that privilege because of jealousy, fear, and lack of humility. Quote, and again, verily I say unto you that it is your privilege and a promise I give unto you that have been ordained unto this ministry, that inasmuch as you strip yourselves from jealousies and fears and humble yourselves before me, for you are not sufficiently humble, the veil shall be rent, and you shall see me and know that I am, not with the carnal, neither natural mind, but with the spiritual. <clears throat> For no man has seen God at any time in the flesh, except quickened by the Spirit of God. Neither can any natural man abide the presence of God, neither after the carnal mind. Ye are not able to abide the presence of God now, neither the ministering of angels. Wherefore, continue in patience until ye are perfected. End of quote. Statements from leaders of the church during this time also indicate that jealousies and contentions manifested themselves before and after the calling took place. One can only imagine the amount of pressure these candidates for the highest priesthood felt, realizing that those who were worthy among them would receive the calling, while everyone else watched. Additionally, some of the elders, including some who were ordained, had a hard time accepting the experience as being from God, and, quote, some doubting took place, end of quote. John Carell makes reference to this in his reminiscence of the event. Quote, there was a revelation received requiring the prophet to call the elders together, that they might receive an endowment. This was done, and the meeting took place some time in June. About fifty elders met, which was about all the elders that belonged to the church then. The meeting was conducted by Smiths. Some curious things took place. The same visionary and marvelous spirits spoken of before got hold of some of the elders. It threw one from his seat to the floor, it bound another, so that for some time he could not use his limbs nor speak, and some other curious effects were experienced. But by a mighty exertion in the name of the Lord it was exposed and shown to be from an evil source. The Melchizedek priesthood was then for the first time introduced and conferred on several of the elders. In this chiefly consisted the endowment, it being a new order, and bestowed authority. However, some doubting took place among the elders and considerable conversation was held on the subject. The elders not fairly understanding the nature of the endowments, it took some time to reconcile all their feelings. Doubts about the High Priesthood During the months and even years to come, some of the brethren involved in this event would begin to question what really took place. Some characterized this holy event as not being of God, claiming that the New Testament Book of Mormon churches never had high priests in them. 
Oliver Cowdery and his brother-in-law, David Whitmer, had become very jealous of Sidney Rigdon when he joined the church and became so influential. They felt he had undue influence over Joseph Smith. David Whitmer felt that Rigdon was the instigator of this event because he kept asking Joseph to ask the Lord about priesthood. Below are the remarks of David Whitmer after he left the church. He's among those who eventually rejected the introduction of the highest priesthood, even though he initially accepted it and served as the president of the church in Zion. Quote, the next grievous error which crept into the church was in ordaining high priests in June, 1831. This error was introduced at the instigation of Sidney Rigdon. The office of high priest was never spoken of. A revelation would always come just as they desired it. Rigdon finally persuaded Brother Joseph and never thought of being established in the church until Rigdon came in. Remember that we'd been preaching from August 1829 until June 1831, almost two years, and had baptized about 2,000 members into the Church of Christ, and had not one high priest. During 1829, several times we were told by Brother Joseph that an elder was the highest office in the church. In Kirtland, Ohio, in 1831, Rigdon would expound the Old Testament scriptures of the Bible and the Book of Mormon in his way to Joseph concerning the priesthood, high priests, etc., and would persuade Brother Joseph to inquire of the Lord about his, this doctrine, and, of course, to believe that the high priest, which had such great power in ancient times, should be in the Church of Christ today. Yet Brother Joseph inquired the Lord about it, and they received an answer according to their erring desires. High priests were only in the church before Christ, and to have this office in the church of Christ is not according to the teachings of Christ in either of the sacred books. Christ himself is our great and last high priest. Um, brethren, I will tell you one thing, which alone should settle this matter in your minds. It is this. You cannot find in the New Testament part of the Bible or Book of Mormon where one single high priest was ever in the Church of Christ, it is grievous sin to have such an office in the Church. As well might you add to the teachings of Christ, circumcision, offering up sacrifice of animals, or break the ordinances of Christ in any way by going back to the old law of Moses. Uh, in Kirtland, Ohio, in June 1831, the first high priests were ordained. When they were ordained, right there at the time, the devil caught and bound Harvey Whitlock, so he could not speak, his face twisted into demon-like shape. Also, John Murdoch and others were caught by the devil in a similar manner. Now, brethren, do you not see that this displeasure of the Lord was upon their proceedings in ordering, ordaining high priests? Of course it was. End of quote. Whitmer brings up an interesting point about no high priest being mentioned in the New Testament church other than Christ. However, what he didn't grasp is that Joseph Smith was not just restoring the New Testament Christianity, he was bringing forth the fullness that had anciently been on the earth. He was commissioned to bring forth Zion as prophesied in the Book of Mormon. Joseph would eventually reveal that the 144,000 servants of God mentioned in the Book of Revelation were high priests. Joseph Smith was restoring many of the Old Testament priesthood powers, including the keys of the priesthood of Aaron and the fullness of priesthood that Elijah, Enoch, and Melchizedek displayed, gifts and preparing the saints to establish Zion just as it had been prophesied in the Book of Mormon. He was doing just as the high priest Enoch did with his people, just as the high priest Melchizedek did with his people, just as the high priest Jesus Christ did with the Nephites. In order for the Church of Christ to establish Zion, the office of the high priest needed to be restored. Brigham Young, uh, like David Whitmer, is another who struggled with the concept of a third and highest priesthood. He'd been comfortable with the first two priesthoods that had been restored in 1829, he would later be in a dubious position, just three and a half years after the martyrdom, when he and others of the Twelve Apostles would take it upon themselves to create a First Presidency, having himself never been ordained a high priest. Undoubtedly, he was under intense pressure to explain how he could claim to be president over the church and the high priesthood when, in fact, he'd never been ordained a high priest. He made the following statement, quote, Now will it cause some of you to marvel that I was not ordained a high priest before I was ordained an apostle. It was William McClellan who told Joseph that I and Heber were not ordained high priests and wanted to know if it should not be done. Said Joseph, knowledge you have of the office of an apostle? Do you not know that the man who receives the apostleship receives all the keys that ever were or that can be conferred upon mortal man? When a man is ordained to be an apostle, his priesthood is without beginning of days or end of life like the priesthood of Melchizedek, for it was his priesthood that was spoken of in this language, and not the man." End of quote. 
Brigham Young's reminiscence that Joseph Smith made the above remark and claim that the apostleship holds all the keys that ever were is a patent contradiction of the scriptures and what Joseph Smith actually taught. Of course, it was not Joseph's prerogative to give the high priesthood to Brigham or any other man. That highest priesthood is not given on the basis of lineage or according to the will of man who has a desire to serve. God alone determines who he calls to be a high priest. Brigham makes it sound like an amazing thing that he could be ordained an apostle first and therefore have no need to be ordained a high priest. However, the simple fact of the matter is that Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were apostles before the highest priesthood was conferred in 1831. Yet God still saw a need to call both of them to be ordained as high priests, proving there is more priesthood authority than that of the apostleship. Joseph Smith made it clear that the office of high priest indeed held a greater priesthood than that of a prophet or apostle. Quote, that of Melchizedek, who had still greater power, even power of an endless life, of which was our Lord Jesus Christ, which also Abraham ordained by the office of his son, offering of his son Isaac, which was not the power of a prophet, nor apostle, nor patriarch only, but of king and priest to God to open the windows of heaven and pour out the peace and law of endless life to man, and no man can attain to the joint heirship with Jesus Christ without being administered to one, two, by one having the same power and authority as Melchizedek, end of quote. Clearly, what Brigham Young taught about the priesthood was not accurate or congruent with what the prophet Joseph Smith had revealed. Although the apostolic priesthood holds all the keys necessary to govern the church and dispense ordinances of salvation, when a high priest is not available, it's not as great as the priesthood that Melchizedek held, which is necessary to establish sign and to obtain one's calling and election. Indeed, the purpose behind the saving ordinances is to lead a person to the Melchizedek ordination and associated endowment. This event took place at the first conference held in Kirtland, Ohio, which was very disruptive. Not only did it demonstrate the literal power of the man of sin, it challenged the existing doctrine of the priesthood. Additionally, one can only imagine the dynamics that took place between so many strong personalities and the egos involved in experiencing this amazing event. Keep in mind that the promise had been made that those who were worthy would be given the high priesthood. What kind of pressure would that put on those attending? How would you feel if you were one of the ones attending and were passed over for the endowment of high priesthood? Would that mean you were not worthy? What if you were one of the ones who became possessed? Does that mean you are less righteous than others? Or was that experience an endowment in and of itself that gifts a person with discernment? Lots of questions come to mind as one reviews the listing of those who were present and who were called to the high priesthood and what transpired that day. Clearly, this is one of the most important and defining events of the history of the church. So why does this event create indigestion for many LDS scholars, authors, and members? Why does the official church history minimize and marginalize the significance of this event? One possible reason is that it contradicts what is currently taught in the church. David Whitmer made the following claim, quote, during 1829, several times we are told by Brother Joseph that an elder was the highest priesthood office in the church, end of quote. That statement may have been made by Joseph Smith, but it did not mean that a higher priesthood was not forthcoming. It's amazing how convoluted the concept of priesthood has become in the modern church. Even today, it is erroneously taught in the church that the apostolic priesthood is the greatest priesthood there is. That's only true if the apostle has been ordained as a high priest. Another possible reason that the restoration of the highest priesthood causes indigestion is that several of the elders ordained to the high priesthood almost immediately rejected the fullness of the gospel and the priesthood they had been given and became critics of Joseph Smith and the church. Others fell away later after a period of time, such as David Whitmer. That is disturbing. The falling away of some who were called to the high priesthood gives greater insight into the Lord's declaration that some were called and some were chosen and it represents the fulfillment of Christ's prophecy in Third Nephi that the Gentiles would reject the fullness. The fact that Lyman had been ordained to the highest priesthood and had seen the Father and the Son while Brigham had not been so privileged seemed to be lost upon the majority of the saints at the time of the succession issue. It did, however, apparently seem significant to Lyman, who seems to have had very little regard for Brigham and chose not to follow him. That reason alone would cause some to want to downplay the significance of the Melchizedek priesthood. But there were other issues pertaining to the restoration of the office of the high priest that are curious as well. 
what about high profile elders who played such an important role in very early stages of the restoration such as william smith levi hancock orson pratt zebedee coltrane and newell knight all who were present but passed over for the highest priesthood what about zebedee coltrane who would eventually see god in christ while attending the school of the prophets why was he initially passed over was he later born of due time like paul it's significant to note that the School of the Prophets was not introduced until after the high priesthood was introduced. Indeed, these newly ordained high priests and others who would follow were the designated prophets for which the school was in instituted. Apparently, Oliver Cowdery, one of the three witnesses and co-presidents of the church, was not even present at this meeting. Present at this meeting. How odd is that? He would become the very first person ordained a high priest after the conference leading one to speculate that he had completed the first quorum, making the total 24. How is it possible that word went out about this meeting, enabling elders from the east, south, north, and west to gather, yet Oliver could not be there? Although the Far West record records David Whitmer as being present, he apparently denies having been present in one of his later writings. Is this his name in the Far West record just a mistake made by some of the clerks? including his own brother, who was the conference historian? If so, it's very strange that his name is listed in the Far West record, and stranger still that he's called as one of the elders who's to travel to Missouri in Section 52, the day after the conference is completed. Curiously, Martin Harris, another of the three witnesses, who the Lord had previously referred to as a wicked man in one of the revelations, was ordained a high priest on that occasion. What about Brigham Young? Why was he missing when the highest priesthood was revealed at the Morley farm? It's interesting to note that Brigham Young had learned about the Book of Mormon and the restoration of the Church of Christ and the fullness of the gospel in 1830, about the same time that Lyman White did. Yet Brigham Young did not participate in this great event at the Morley farm because it took him two years to think things over before joining the church. Young was eventually drawn to Mormonism after reading the Book of Mormon shortly after its publication in 1830. Samuel Smith, brother of the prophet Joseph, tracked through the area with a knapsack full of the newly printed scripture where the young family lived. Two of these copies made their way into the hands of Brigham's siblings and began to circulate throughout the family. Brigham Young later reminisced his lengthy conversion process, quote, When the Book of Mormon was first printed, it came into my hands in two or three weeks afterwards. Did I believe on the first intimation of it? Hold on, says I. Wait a little while. What is in the what is the doctrine of the book and of the revelations the Lord has given? Let me apply my heart to them. I considered it to be my right to know for myself as much as any man on earth. I examined the matter studiously for two years before I made up my mind to receive that book. I wished time sufficient to prove all things for myself. He later recalled, I was not baptized on hearing the first sermon, nor the second, nor during the first year of my acquaintance with this work. End of quote. Besides studying the Book of Mormon, Brigham wanted to learn the character of those who professed to believe in it. He apparently found it important to judge the messengers as well as the message. Quote, I watched to see whether good common sense was manifest, and if they had that, I wanted them to present it in accordance with the scriptures. When I had ripened everything in my mind, I drank it in, and not till then. End of quote. We can only assume that Brigham's absence at the special conference and God's unwillingness to have him ordained to the highest priesthood after he did join were all part of God's plan for him. Perhaps one of the most curious things about this event is the order in which people were called and ordained to the high priesthood. We know that God is a God of order. The very first man ordained obviously had a very significant position in this newly ordained quorum of high priests. It seems probable that he would be the president of the quorum. The fact that Lyman White was the first to be ordained the high priesthood and the first to have the heavens parted and to testify of seeing the Father and the Son after his ordination, instead of Joseph Smith, Otto Calgary, or Sidney Rigdon, is very, very significant. Lyman White became one of the most powerful missionaries, and he relentlessly pushed for the redemption of Zion. Here is Lyman's reminiscence of the event. Quote, on the 4th of June, 1831, a conference was held at Kirtland, Ohio, represented by all the above-named branches. Joseph Smith, our modern prophet, presided, and here I again saw the visible manifestations of the power of God, as plain as could have been on the day of Pentecost, and here for the first time I saw the Melchizedek priesthood introduced into the Church of Jesus Christ as anciently, 
whereinto I was ordained under the hands of Joseph Smith, and I then ordained Joseph and Sidney and sixteen others such as he chose unto the same priesthood. The Spirit of God was made manifest to the healing of the sick, casting out devils, speaking in unknown tongues, discerning the spirits, and the prophesying with mighty power. After the two days the conference broke up, receiving the revelation which appointed twenty-eight elders their mission to Missouri. End of quote. Lyman White is one of the best-kept secrets of the Restoration Movement. Few members of the church have any comprehension of who he was and the sacrifices he made for the kingdom. This amazing disciple of Christ became known as the Wild Ram of the Mountains, was given the cryptic title and military priesthood title of Benini in one of the revelations. He's among the first laborers of the last kingdom that will be returning soon. I strongly suggest you get to know him. He probably expended more energy in trying to live the law of consecration for the duration of his life than any other personality in the movement. In a revelation given after his ordination as a high priest, the Lord said, quote, And again I say unto you that it's my will that my servant Lyman White should continue in preaching for Zion, in the spirit of meekness, confessing me before the world, and I will bear him up as on eagle's wings, and he shall beget glory and honor to himself and unto my name. End of quote. And that's in uh, section 84. This revelation reminds us the high priests were called to preach for Zion. If there's one major theme interwoven throughout White's long, long, lifelong ministry, it was his continual personal attempt to live consecration and facilitate others to do it. He was passionate about living it and was quite critical of other leaders growing out of the succession debate, such as Strang, Thompson, and Young, for their inability to personally live consecration, as well as their acquisition of wealth, which he felt was extracted from their followers. One writer made the following observation about White, quote, There's one significant thing about Lyman White's community efforts, which deserves attention because of its extreme rarity in utopian experiments. White, as acknowledged leader, never desired or sought temporal or spiritual advantage over his fellows. When he received letters from Strang, quote, King James, the first president of the church, end of quote, or from Brigham Young telling of ecclesiastical honors acquired since the death of Joseph and Thompson with his many titles, he was wont to sign his answer with profound sarcasm, quote, Lyman White and nothing else, end of quote. In scathing denunciation of those who thought, uh, who, whom he thought were acquiring wealth at the expense of their brethren, he wrote of the Melchizedek priesthood, quote, but those who aspire after this priesthood and seek to obtain it while rolling in luxuries and seeking the applause of men, I would simply ask them these questions. Have you drunk of the cup whereof Christ drank? And have you been baptized with the baptism wherewith he was baptized? Have you followed the commandment that he gave to the young man and sold all that thou hadst and give it to the poor? Have you sold the last coat you had and traveled in your shirt sleeves? sooner than you would see the poor left to the ravages of a ruthless mob? Have you traveled on foot hundreds and hundreds of miles and sought a place for the saints to camp at, night after night, that they might seclude themselves from the hands of wicked and evil designing men, and then roll yourselves in a blanket and lay yourself in an open prairie under the open canopy of heaven in the cold night dews? If you have not done all these, you have not fulfilled the saying of the Savior, where he says, if you would be greatest, you must first become the least and servant of all. I again ask, when did the church flourish? When the Nephites that dwelled upon this land did not call, ought they possessed their own, but it all belonged to the Lord. When did the people mourn and lament and howl and weep? I answer, when their priests were lifted up in the pride of their hearts, to the wearing of fine apparel and oppressing the poor and the hireling in his wages, riding in fine carriages, with cushioned seats, bristled carpets, leaving the poor to work out their own salvation among those who are their vital enemies, while the rich and opulent were permitted to increase in opulence by tithing and wringing from the hands of the peasant his hard earnings. End of quote. Lyman White was one of the few personalities that practiced what he preached, and one of the few that other leaders with strong personalities could not intimidate or control. The timing of the special conference at the Morley Farm is very significant. We must remember that it was the first conference of the church in Kirtland. The church was in its infancy and had just migrated to Kirtland 
as a result of the Lord's admonition to gather there so he could give them the law of consecration and an endowment which would enable them to escape the power of the enemy, quote, and that she might escape the power of the enemy and be gathered unto me a righteous people without spot and blameless. Wherefore, for this cause, I gave unto you the commandment that you should go to the Ohio, and there I'll give unto you my law, and there you shall be endowed with power from on high. End of quote. That's section 38. It's amazing to realize that today the saints are in a scattered condition among the Gentiles and are now at the mercy of secret combinations because we failed back then to live consecration and enjoy the protective priesthood hedge that was being offered. The law of consecration was given to the saints shortly after they arrived in Kirtland on January 2nd of 1831. This law is what will enable the saints to establish Zion once they're endowed again with the highest priesthood. That is why it's called the law of the celestial kingdom, and it is the law upon which Zion is built. Quote, and Zion cannot be built up unless it's on the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. Otherwise, I cannot receive her unto myself. End of quote. Now, in this first conference in the church, held just two months after the law of the gospel was given, the Lord was restoring the priesthood that Enoch and Melchizedek held. Why? So that the saints could be gathered, sanctified, and established Zion, just as the people of Enoch and Melchizedek did. Having detailed what happened at the special conference having to do with the restoration of the highest priesthood and the revealing of the man of sin, we need to review the content in sections 52 through 65, now that we have the proper context for these revelations. Amazingly, section 52, which is given the day after the conference ended and was specifically addressing the conference attendees, begins by saying, quote, Behold, thus saith the Lord unto the elders whom he hath called and chosen in these last days by the voice of his Spirit, saying, I, the Lord, will make known unto you what I will that you shall do from this time until the next conference, which shall be held in Missouri, upon the land which I will consecrate unto my people, which are a remnant of Jacob, and those who are heirs according to the covenant. End of quote. That's section 52. Most Latter-day Saints like myself until just recently have read section 52 countless times without realizing that those elders who had just been called and chosen were the 23 high priests who had just received the Melchizedek priesthood. Context is critical. If you're not a Latter-day Saint, be grateful that you have not been hampered with a false context that comes from the false traditions of your fathers. If you are, read this section now with the information you have just obtained about the amazing conference at the Morley Farm and it will become much more meaningful to you. Although do I do not agree with some of the assumptions made about the people listed on the secret document that I obtained, um, it led me to the knowledge of an amazing historical event that has been largely obscured and forgotten. There's much to be gleaned by studying what happened at the special conference of the Morley Farm. Those desiring to learn more are encouraged to visit my blog and read the entire series about searching for the 23 high priests. Once a person understands what really took place at the special conference of the Morley Farm, the Doctrine and Covenants will never read the same way from section 52 forward. The whole context of the revelations will change. In the next chapter, we'll take some of the information gleaned from the conference and with other passages of scripture, we'll present a primer on priesthood.